Chabata Chalam. Chabata Chalam, everybody. Hey, brothers and sisters. Today we have some very important information to discuss. The war with Iran and America has officially started. Prior to that war with Iran being full scale, America will try to keep the war in the Middle East, knowing that America itself needs to subdue its citizens. The main attack is on the Israelites more than anyone else in America. This that's coming, they're making the excuse that they have to get the country in subjection because even in the book of 3rd Maccabees, Ptolemy used the same excuse to kill all the Israelites. They said that the Israelites were enemies to the nation and that if they have war, the Israelites are going to join the enemies and fight against them, hence they needed to get rid of them. And this is the same thing as we recall when we looked over what happened in the Exodus. The Egyptians did the same thing. So they're doing it again here in the end to prepare to destroy the children of Israel. Now we're going to start looking at these prophecies to see that this time that is to come is going to be a very evil time, great tribulation. We start at Micah chapter 2, verse 3 to 5, please. Micah chapter 2, verse 3. Therefore, thus saith Ahiah, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil. Notice he's talking to the Israelites. Okay. From which ye shall not remove your necks, right. neither shall ye go haughtily. So our pride won't deliver us from this that is to come. Okay. For this time is evil. Right. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, we be utterly spoiled. So this is going to come to pass. People are going to be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. They shall take everything they have there. As we mentioned, this is going to come to pass. Continue. Therefore, thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of Ahia. Just like they took all our possessions in Egypt, so shall it be in America. Let's look at Joshua chapter 63, verse 2 to 3, please. Joshua chapter 63, verse 2. And it came to pass after the death of Lawaiye, when all Egypt saw that the sons of Jacob, the brethren of Yasapho, were dead, all the Egyptians began to afflict the children of Jacob, and to embitter their lives from that day unto the day of their going forth from Egypt. And they took from their hands all the vineyards and fields which Yathapho had given unto them, and all the elegant houses in which the people of Israel lived, and of the fat of Egypt. And the Egyptians took all from the sons of Jacob in those days. And the hand of all Egypt became more grievous in those days against the children of Israel. And the Egyptians injured the Israelites until the children of Israel were wearied of their lives on account of the Egyptians. See, see, that's the process. They have to take everything, and that's the same thing they bring into America. Also, can you read Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1 to 9, please? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, the Adonai Ahia Sobawata doeth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and oh. the whole stay of water. All resources taken. Is this is what's coming? Continue. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. They are already being ruled by babes in righteousness who don't know or keep the law. I don't remember what lesson we went over it, but as a newborn babe, so they can know the reference. Hebrews chapter 5, 13 or 11 to 14, talks about how being a babe, we're unskilled in the words of righteousness. Right. People that don't understand the law. And that's literally what's happening today because what is being taught is according to lawlessness. They even just, uh, was it in California, they gave the decree that all the churches have to teach and embrace the LGBT. So you see, it's only going to increase as we get closer. I'll continue. And the people shall be oppressed, right. every one by another, every one by his neighbor. Also, the Israelites are going to be oppressing each other because this is what the Israelites do. They've shown it in their track record. Right. When times are rough, they fight against each other, even so. though everyone else is fighting against them. This is the same thing they were doing in Jerusalem in 70 AD when it was conquered, as we're going to see when we look at what Josephus gave account of. 
The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. That happened in the days of Josephus too. And the base against the honorable. The oppression is going to be from other nations as well as among the Israelites that are there. As we continue reading. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. There you can see how bad things are going to be. The very fact that somebody just had clothing on their back was a reason they felt he should be the ruler. But let's continue and see. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. So even the person that had clothing, he was letting them know, I am not taking that responsibility because I don't even have bread and clothing in my house. The people are going to be destitute when this thing gets to its fullness. Continue. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the highest. And you see exactly why this is coming for our iniquities and for our proud speech and transgressing his law and speaking against his law. Continue. To provoke the eyes of his glory. This is the time of the southern kingdom's visitation for its iniquity. Continue. The show of their countenance do witness against them. Continue. And they declare their sin in Sodom. They hide it not. And people are lifted up. They don't care anymore. They're just doing what they want to do, living their life. Right. Continue. Right. There was a time where the quote unquote LGBT type of movement was in the dark. Mm -hmm. But now it's come out. It's right. Nobody's hiding it. They anymore. declare their sin in Sodom. It's right. outright and blatant. Mm -hmm. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Yes, they have. And the evil is coming. And notice it's not by Ahayah's doing, but it's we made the wrong choices and we're getting rewarded because he's a righteous judge. The southern kingdom is bold as Sodom that they don't have any shame to hide their sins. The primary sin of Sodom was pride. As Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 49 showed, which is what is overcoming the children of Israel today. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12 to 13 and then verse 16 to 18. Okay. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, Ahia would not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their good shall become a booty. In their houses of desolation. So there we see, just for the thought of thinking, ah, I will not do good, neither will he do evil. Like nothing is going to happen. Things are going to continue. Therefore, their good shall become a booty. And your houses shall be a desolation. They're emptying everything out. They're going to take it all. Continue. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink of the wine thereof. Verse 16. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. We have to see now and understand who is bringing these things to pass. We tend to blame everything on Satan, but don't understand Ahaya is Allahayam. He actually controls everything. So this reward for our iniquities is his hand coming down upon us for the fulfillment of the covenant that we have broken. We look at Amos chapter 3 verse 6 to see that he actually is the controller and nothing is done without his consent. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? And we saw it in verse 16 of Zephaniah. It said a day of trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, right? Continue. Shall there be evil in the city and Ahiah hath not done it? So we see who truly controls it all. That's why that when we have began in Isaiah, it said, Adono, Ahaya, and Sobawata, they'll take away the bread and the staff. And this is Yache. He is rendering righteous judgment because he said he would give every man according as his work shall be. Let's continue to see that this is the hand of Ahaya coming upon his people for their sins. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 17. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the higher and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung and these things are truly going to come to pass let's continue in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 18 please neither shall their silver nor their gold be able to deliver them in the day of the highest wrath but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land yes it shall come to pass Proverbs chapter 16 verse 5 please 
Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Ahia. Right. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So you see, in pride, even if they're in agreement, though hand joined in hand, it doesn't matter. And Babylon has been more lifted up than any place in the world. And it's going to get its reward that's coming. Uh, can you read Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 31 to 34, please? Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 31. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud, saith Adonai Ahayel, um Sobowata, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. Right. And I will kindle a fire in the cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Right. Thus saith Ahayel, um Sobowata, the children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together, and all that took them captive held them fast. Right. They refuse to let them go. America refused to let us go. Hence, Ahia will plead for us and judge her. The ten horns didn't let us go either, which are the ten initial member states of the Western European Union. They didn't let us go either. But their judgment will come after America is already gone when Yache comes back. So this is why we're focusing on America because America is going to be judged first. And uh, just to give edification on that, when he said America refused to let us go because we became citizens of America. And no matter where you go in the world, you have that U.S. passport. And if you do anything wrong in any other country or if America just wants you back, all they have to do is send word to the country and they will, they will deport you. So they refuse to let you go. All that they give you more liberty now than they did in ancient times. It's still the same thing. Yes. We still, they still deem us as their property. Right. So, and there's some people who can't even get out of the country. Right. What their affliction there. Uh, can you read verse 34, please, of, of Jeremiah chapter 50? Their Redeemer is strong. And this is Yache, he's our Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Continue. Ahaya Unsabuata is his name. That's Yache. He is Ahaya Unsabuata. He's the captain of the host. That he was the one that came to Joshua in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Continue. He shall thoroughly plead their cause, that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. All right, he's going to plead against Babylon. We will read Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 1 to 6. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 1. Thus saith Ahiah, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that raise up against me. A destroying wind. So he's going against Babylon and them that dwell in the midst of Babylon. He's raising up a destroying wind. That's a very grievous evil spirit that's going to come up and be brought up to destroy them. That evil spirit is spoken of in the Testament of Solomon. Yes, it is. That destroying wind is going to not only destroy Babylon, it's going to also destroy them in the midst of it. That's why you don't want to be there for it. And will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her. And shall empty her land. And the fanner is a more evil spirit that are going to accompany. Accompany yes. that come with him? Okay. Right. Because they're going to make the, the evil spirit more powerful. Wow. That's why the fanner is like when you have a fire. Right. It, it, it right. causes it to grow bigger and bigger. For in the day of trouble, they shall be against her round about. So you see, evil spirits are just going to encompass her. And Elohim is a spirit. So he's telling of things, what's going to be happening physically and what's going to be happening in the spiritual realm. These evil spirits are going to encompass it and that, hence the place is going to be so bad because they're getting unleashed and given power to do their will. That's right. If you read the Testament of Solomon, you'll see when you figure out which entity is the one that is the, the Russian one, what's it say? The, the, the destroying, destroying wind. wind. Once you figure out which one it is, it'll make more sense as to why that spirit has dominion over other spirits to go and destroy Babylon. Citizens will be in trouble domestically while being surrounded by foreign military to destroy them when the war comes. So what looks like is just something carnally happening, now you have an understanding of the spirits that's behind it. Even as they encompass Jerusalem around about in 70 AD, and they were destroying whoever came out of there. You even had the Syrians and Arabians, they would kill you and then gut you to see if you had gold in your stomach because the people were trying to eat their gold and flee out of the city. So what is to come is going to be grievous. 
Continue. Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifteth himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her hosts. Spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her hosts. Continue, please. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans. Right. And they that are thrust through in her streets. People are going to be getting shot, killed, and, and even literally stabbed with whatever weapons people can find as they're pillaging for food and clothing and things of that nature. It's going to be, it's going to be complete chaos. Continue reading, please, verse 5. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his Elohim, of Ahia on Sabawata. Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, His mercy didn't depart. Because even though we were both in iniquity, He has even been gracious to warn us nonetheless to get out of there and repent. Because the kingdom is at hand. Verse 6, please. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of Ahia's vengeance. It will render unto her a recompense. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. It has been said repeatedly, it's guaranteed to come to pass. Let's read Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of Ahiah cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners that are out of it. Right. Second Ezra chapter 15 verse 19 please A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor But shall destroy their houses with the sword That's what people is no love anymore right. no, no concept of humanity When this thing gets to its fullness They're coming in your houses with weapons They're coming in There's no consideration for anyone or anything Continue The quote unquote gangs Right, because they're going to be grouping up. Right. Kind of like Book of Eli, actually. The movie Book of Eli gave a similitude of what they're going to be doing. Right. Ravaging and pillaging. Right. A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor, but shall destroy their houses with the sword. Right. And spoil their goods because of the lack of bread and for great tribulation. And there we see how they're going to, we talked about how they're going to take everyone's resource to the point of depression. And this, so there's going to be famine in the respect of people not having anything. Hence, the rule of um, the sh survival of the fittest, that wicked concept. The strong overcome the weak. Right. They're going to be applying it and doing whatever they want to everyone, wh whomever they like. It's going to be a very bad time. Now, we're going to go into the book of Josephus. And we're going to read about some of the events that happened during the siege of Jerusalem to get an understanding of how things will be in these times when the American government starts to really bring the crackdown on the citizens in America and take everything and cause the people to be in complete depression and go into the civil war and all the wickedness that's going to come in America. And notice, this is all before the war with Iran actually hits American soil completely. Right. This is the before. This is why we're talking about these things leading up to the war. Let's uh, look at the atrocities of the famine in Book of Josephus, The Wars of the Jews, Book 5, Chapter 10. We're going to pick up from Paragraph 1 and read up to Paragraph 3. We're going to go down a ways into Paragraph 1, starting from that highlight. Okay. If you want, I don't know if they can, that number will help them. Uh, there's a number here where we're starting at. It's 423, um, right there at chapter 10 in book 5, verse 1. Okay. However, John and Simon, with their factions, did more carefully watch these men going out than they did the coming in of the Romans. So the Romans are already surrounding Jerusalem. There were people trying to leave Jerusalem to flee to the Romans and Simon and the other man they had their cliques and they started watching to make sure nobody could actually leave right and remember how we talked about people are going to begin destroyed one from another and from each his neighbor right. this shows that these are Israelites the Israelites are going to be doing a lot of wickedness as well it's not just going to be the Gentiles that are attacking the children of Israel and if anyone did but afford the least shadow of suspicion of such an intention, his throat was cut immediately. But as for the richer sort, 
It proved all one to them whether they stayed in the city or attempted to get out of it. So the people that had money, it didn't make no difference. They went bad case whether they stayed in the city or got out. For they were equally destroyed in both cases. Right. For every such person was put to death under this pretense that they were going to desert. But in reality, that the robbers might get what they had. The madness of the seditious did also increase together with their famine. And both those miseries were every day in flame more and more. So further people go into depression, the more wicked things get. For there was no corn which anywhere appeared publicly. But the robbers came running in too, and searched men's private houses. And then if they found any, they tormented them, because they had denied they had any. So they were going in people's houses, just like Second Ezra said. And if they found none, they tormented them worse because they supposed they had more carefully concealed it. The indication they made use of whether they had any or not was taken from the bodies of these miserable wretches, which if they were in good case, they supposed they were in no want at all of food. So if you look like you were healthy enough, they believe you had to add something. Right. But if they were wasted away, they walked off without searching any further. Nor did they think it proper to kill such as these, because they saw they would very soon die of themselves for want of food. Many there were indeed who sold what they had for one measure. It was a wheat, if they were of the richer sort, but of barley, if they were poor. When these had so done, they shut themselves up in the inmost rooms of their houses and ate the corn they had gotten. Some did it without grinding it, by reason of the extremity of the want they were in. And others baked the bread of it according to necessity, and fear dictated to them. A table was nowhere laid for a distinct meal, but they snatched the bread out of the fire, half-baked, and ate it very hastily. It was now a miserable case, and a sight that would justly bring tears into our eyes. How men stood as to their food while the more powerful had more than enough. So there were people starving while others still had food. And this is what they're going to be doing. They're going to be going around pillaging everyone, storing up food for themselves and leaving others to starve. Right. That whole brotherhood thing, that's going right out the window. Right. Continue. And the weaker were lamenting for one of it. But the famine was too hard for all other passions, and it is destructive to nothing so much at the modesty. So you see how because of the famine it destroyed all passion. No human emotion. Everyone was just looking out for themselves. For what was otherwise worthy of reverence was in this case despised. Insomuch that children pulled the very morsels that their father were eaten out of their very mouths. And what was still more to be pitied so did the mothers do to their infants. So you see how the child, the young, shall lift himself up against the elder. Right. Children were so hungry, they're snatching food out of their parents' mouth. This is how terrible things have got. Continue. And when those that were most dear were perished under their hands, they were not ashamed to take from them the very last drops that might preserve their lives. And while they ate after this manner, Yet were they not concealed in so doing. But the seditious everywhere came upon them immediately, and snatched away from them what they had gotten from others. For when they saw any house shut up, this was to them a signal that the people within had gotten some food. Whereupon they broke open the doors, and ran in and took pieces of what they were eating, almost up out of their very throats, and this by force. The old men who held their food fast were beaten. And if women hid what they had within their hands, the hair was torn for so doing. Nor was there any commiseration shown either to the aged or to the infants. But they lifted up children from the ground as they hung upon the morsels they had gotten and shook them down upon the floor. But still, they were more barbarously cruel to those that had prevented their coming in and had actually swallowed down what they were going to seize upon as if they had been unjustly defrauded of their right. They also invented terrible methods of torment to discover where any food was, and they were these. To stop up the passages of the private parts of the miserable wretches 
and to drive sharp stakes up their fundaments. And a man was forced to bear what it is terrible even to hear in order to make them confess what they had. But one loaf of bread or that he might discover a handful of barley meal that was concealed. And this was done when these tormentors were not themselves hungry. For the thing had been less barbarous had necessity forced them to it. But it was done to keep their madness in exercise, and as making preparation to provision for themselves for the following days. So you see how people are going to be completely gone, even as they were completely gone at that time. It says, um, but this was done to keep their madness in exercise. They were fulfilling their lust of their iniquity. Oh, man. They and wanted this was, to do that. Right. This is, they just finally got free range to do it. They wanted to torture people. And then it says, um, and as making preparations for provisions for themselves for the following days. So that way they were storing up food. Right. These men went also to meet those that had crept out of the city by night, as far as the Romans' guards, to gather some plants and herbs that grew wild. And when those people thought they had got clear of the enemy, these snatched from them what they had brought with them, even while they had frequently entreated them, and that by calling upon the tremendous name of Elohim, to give them back some part of what they had brought. That's sad. It said that, uh, even while they had frequently entreated them. Tried to work with them. They weren't having it. Though these would not give them the least crumb, and they were to be well contented, that they were only spoiled and not slain at the See, same time. Hear that response. They get, didn't give him a crumb and told him, be content that you didn't die, that all that happened is you got your stuff taken. That's what's going to be happening. That's the, what's going, the types of things the Israelites are going to be operating in. And all people, because everyone's given over to iniquity. Right. The evil spirits are taking over. If you're hearing this, you understand that this is not this is physical people doing things, but these are evil spirits working in them. Because there's no concept of humanity. There's no love for mankind in at this time. Everyone is given over. Those fanners even that was mentioned, those evil spirits are in people and working and destroying everyone. That's right. Uh, how far did you make it there? That's um, the end of verse 3. All right. So that was just one part. Now, let's look at um, the wall got built, and then we can see how they plundered the dead and the famished people. We can go to uh, Wars of the Jews, Book 5, Chapter 12, Paragraph 2 and 3. Start at this right here, please. All right, I'm starting in Paragraph 2 at 510. When Titus had therefore encompassed the city with this wall and put garrisons into proper places, he went round the wall at the first watch of the night and observed how the guard was kept. All right, so let's jump to paragraph three now. So that was just seen that they traced the city round about the wall, okay? So all hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews, together with their liberty of going out of the city. Then did the famine widen its progress, and devoured the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying by famine, and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also and the young men wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with famine, and fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. As for burying them, those that were sick themselves were not able to do it, and those that were hearty and well were deterred from doing it by the great multitude of those dead bodies, and by the uncertainty there was how soon they should die themselves, for many died as they were burying others, and many went to their coffins before that fatal hour was come. Nor was there any lamentation made under these calamities, nor were heard any mournful complaints but the famine confounded all natural passions. For those who were just going to die looked upon those that were gone to their rest before them with dry eyes and open mouths. A deep silence also, a kind of deadly night, had seized upon the city, 
while yet the robbers were still more terrible than these miseries were themselves. But all that bad stuff, the robbers are worse. That's these groups that we were talking about. They're going to be ganging up and raiding. And plundering. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be, oh, I have said it's his wrath. These are the days of vengeance. And so it is. Continue. For they break open those houses which were no other than graves of their bodies, and plundered them of what they had, and carried off the coverings of their bodies, and went out laughing, and tried the points of their swords in their dead bodies. They were actually laughing as they were doing it. Right. And playing around with the dead bodies, poking them. Seeing how sharp their sword was. It's going to be sad. It's going to be sad. Continue. And in order to prove what metal they were made of, they thrust some of those through that still lay alive upon the ground. So if that person is still alive, they're testing to see if they got enough heart in killing the people. This is a gang. This is like gang initiation right. type stuff to see them. And we know how our people do. Once things get bad, we, we come into a gang. Either join them or not. That get down or lay down, mind. Right. These are Israelites. The same thing. Right? They they study us in the prisons. That's the same thing that goes on in like Rikers Island and stuff like that. You either get with a gang because they feel you're not going to be able to make it on your own. You get with a gang or you're going to have to be on the side of the police, the military, and we know what's going to happen with that. Right. So. Don't die either way. Right. This is what this, this is what's coming. Carnality. These are Israelites we're reading about. Right. These aren't the Gentiles that's doing this. It's just showing you what the Israelites gonna do to each other. Right. As the as the Gentiles sit back and watch. It happened in seventy it happened in what the sixty eight AD? The right? This is it, exactly. They literally set back no no, this is before this. You th you're talking about the other part of the war. I, right. I can't recall yeah, exactly. It's another part of the war. Yeah. I think it was like 68 AD that the Romans seen us start fighting against the each other. Sakari versus someone else. Right. I can't remember who the other one was. And they literally just sat back and let them kill each other. And they're doing it to this day. They leave us in the, they gave us the guns in the neighborhoods and leave us to shoot each other. Right. And then come in after the fact and collect us. So. The same people. But for those that entreated them to lend them their right hand and their sword to dispatch them, they were too proud to grant the request. Wow. So somebody was literally dying. He was like, yo, just take me out. They were like, I can't do that. But they would practice killing you for their own uh, testing of their heart or testing of their, their loyalty. Oh, sake. It was, it's pride because they don't want to do what you're asking them to do. They want to do what they want to do. So, and left them to be consumed by the famine. Now, every one of these died with their eyes fixed upon the temple and left the seditious alive behind them. Now, the seditious at first gave orders that the dead should be buried out of the public treasury as not enduring the stench of their dead bodies. But afterwards, when they could not do that, they had them cast down from the walls unto the valleys beneath. So they just tossed the people off over the walls. This was the this is the behavior of the Israelites when things got bad. Wow. Can we go to Book Six, Chapter Three, uh, Paragraph Three, please? To yeah. see how in the famine there was the robbery that was happening for food. Alright. Don't start right there, you don't start somewhere else. This thing was started right there. Okay. Yeah, down at the yeah, chapter. Yeah. Chapter three, verse three. Yeah, chapter three, verse three, and then we're gonna read uh uh four as well. Now of those that perished by famine in the city, the number was prodigious, and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. 
For if so, after the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war was commenced presently, and the dearest friends fell at fighting one with another about it. Yache said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There's no concept of friends at this time. Right. Snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food. But the robbers would search them when they were expiring, at least anyone should have concealed food in their bosoms and counterfeited dying. So they actually thought they were faking death. <laughs> Nay, these robbers gaped for want and ran about stumbling and staggering along like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of the houses like drunken men. They would also, in the great distress they were in, rush into the very same houses two or three times in the same day. Moreover, the hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything. When they gathered such things as the moist, sordid animals would not touch, and endured to eat them, nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes, and the very leather which belonged to their shield they pulled off and gnawed. The very wisp of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibers and sold a very small weight of them for four attic. But why do I describe the shameless impudence that the famine brought on men in their eating inanimate things, while I am going to render a matter of fact, the like to which no history relates, either among the Greeks or barbarians? It is horrible to speak of and incredible when heard. I had indeed willingly omitted this calamitous calamity of ours, that I might not seem to deliver what is so portentous to posterity, but that I have innumerable witnesses to it in my own age, and besides my country would have had little reason to thank me for suppressing the miseries that she underwent at this time. Uh, he gave that prologue because he's about to tell of something that happened that was a gross event and everyone who heard it just shut up the ears. This is what we're going to read in uh, book 6, chapter 3, paragraph 4. There was a certain woman that dwelt beyond Jordan. Her name was Mary. Her father was Eliezer of the village of Bethesda, which signifies the house of his son. She was imminent for her family and her wealth, and had fled away to Jerusalem with the rest of the multitude. So this was a woman that had money, and she fled to the Jerusalem with the rest of the multitude. Note that she didn't believe the prophecy that she needed to get out of there when she went to Jerusalem. So continue. Please. And was with them besieged therein at this time. The other effects of this woman had been already seized upon which I mean as she had brought with her out of Perea and removed to the city what she had treasured up besides as also what food she had contrived to save had been also carried off by the rapacious guards who came every day running into the house for that purpose this put the poor woman into a very great passion and by the frequent reproaches and imprecations she cast at these rapacious villains she had provoked them to anger against her, but none of them, either out of the indignation she had raised against herself or out of the commiseration of her case, would take away her life. So you see the sad thing? They wouldn't even... They were, they were playing like mind games with the woman. Right. They would rob her every day, leave her without food to eat, and then still leave her alive. Instead of just killing her and taking everything, driving her crazy, and we see where it led her to. And if she found any food, she perceived her labors were for others and not for herself. And it was now become impossible for her any way to find any more food, while the famine pierced through her very bowels and marrow. When also her passion was fired to a degree beyond the famine itself. Now this is then you know when the evil spirit took her over completely. Right. It says her passion was fired. She's gone now. Right? Nor did she consult with anything but with her passion 
and the necessity she was in. See, now she's completely given over to her feelings. Right. That lets you know when one is in motion, it's an evil spirit. She's gone completely now. Right? Continue. She then attempted a most unnatural thing and snatching up her son, who was a child suckling at her breast, she said, O thou most miserable infant, for whom shall I preserve thee in this war, this famine, and this sedition? As to the war with the Romans, if they preserve our lives, we must be slaves. This famine also will destroy us, even before that slavery comes upon us. Yet are these seditious roads more terrible than both the other? Come on, be thou my food. She told her child, be thou my food. And be thou with fury to these seditious varlets, and a byword to the world, which is all that is now wanting to complete the calamities of us Jews. She justified why she was going to eat her child, and then uses her child also against the people. This is a part of the curses of Deuteronomy 28, 58. The tender 28 and 56, I'm sorry. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith the enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. These things came to pass, and they're going to come to pass again. As soon as she had said these, she slew her son, and then roasted him, and ate the one half of him, and kept the other half by her concealed. Upon this, the seditious came presently, and smelling the horrid scent of this food, they threatened her that they would cut her throat immediately if she did not show them what food she had gotten ready. So they smell food and they came in and finally said that what? They finally threatened that they'll actually kill her if she don't tell them what food she had gotten ready, right? She replied that she had saved a very fine portion of it for them and withal uncovered what was left of her son. Hereupon, they were seized with a horror and amazement of mind and stood astonished at the sight. When she said to them, this is my own son, and what hath been done with my own doing. Come, eat of this food, for I have eaten of it myself. Do not you pretend to be either more tender than a woman, or more compassionate than a mother. But if you be so scripturalist, and do abominate this my sacrifice, as I have eaten the one half, let the rest be reserved for me also. This is crazy. Right. She told him, "Don't act like you're like you're too like you have too much humanity not to eat this child too." Right. And if you think and if you do and you think this is abominable, then leave it for me. Let me eat him. After which, those men went out trembling, being never so much or frightened at anything as they were at this. So, with all their wickedness, they were uh, horrified at what she did knowing that they were the ones that drove her to it. Right. Like they had morals. And with some difficulty, they left the rest of that meat to the mother. And notice with some difficulty. Right. They actually were tempted to do it. This is the things that were going on. And these are the things that are going to come. And that isn't the first time that type of thing happened. No. Matter of fact, in 2 Kings, when there was a famine, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 25 to verse 30, it says, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of a dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, then there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my Adonai, O king. And he said, If Ahaya do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? 
She answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth upon his flesh. That happened in the northern kingdom during uh, a famine in the land. So you see these, what the curses say, these evil spirits are going to overtake these women and they're going to do that. That whole concept of motherly love, when that famine and all that destruction and all that weariness of the chaos comes, people are going to forsake all, all those emotions that they think would actually help them. Because the only true thing that would help us is Yache. The one that has dominion over all these evil spirits that they have to obey. So with that, we can stop there with Josephus. Uh, yeah, I think that, that was uh, pretty bad. Right. Yeah. Oh, do you want to go to uh, 6 and 5? Oh, yes. 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 So also in the days of Josephus, when they were destroying Jerusalem, there were false prophets at that time too. The same way there are false prophets now that are telling people they don't have to leave America. There are false prophets that were saying the same things of that nature, telling the people they're going to be delivered while, while staying there instead of obeying the command to leave. And also, Ahaya was showing signs under the people that they needed to leave. But through the spirit of unbelief, the people were taking the signs, thinking that we're actually telling them that they should stay. So we're going to look at that in the book of Josephus, Wars of the Jews, book 6, chapter 5, paragraph uh, 2 and 3. I'm going to start at uh, this 285 in paragraph 2. Okay. A false prophet was the occasion of these people's destruction. So the people that got destroyed and they tell them now you understand why they, get, why they got destroyed because of this false prophet. A false prophet was the occasion of these people's destruction who had made a public proclamation in the city that very day that Allah commanded them to get up upon the temple and that there they should receive miraculous signs of their deliverance. Now there was then a great number of false prophets suborned by the tyrants to impose upon the people who denounced this to them that they should wait for deliverance from Allah can you read that part again please now there was then a great number of false prophets it's a great number of false prophets suborned so, by the tyrants to impose upon the people so the tyrants were helping them right the, the tyrants employed them this lets you know that people actually they know what's coming right. and they're willfully playing their part to get everyone destroyed. Pay it off. This is why you have the quote unquote uh, 501c3 government uh, tax exemptions and all the different programs that the government has for such for such false prophets. The word suborn means to bribe or otherwise induce someone to commit an unlawful act, such as perjury. They're paying people to lie. Right. They're paid off. That's why, like the LGBT thing, they made it a law that they have to encourage it. These pastors have to do it. They can't speak against it. Right. They've been bought off. The same with these groups. They are part of it. It's every religion. Oh yes, they're all a part of it. And what do they induce the people to do? To stay. Right. To go against what Ahaya said to do, to stay and tell them they're going to be miraculously delivered. The very false doctrine that's being led about today, it's the same thing that was being said in Josephus. And the same tyrants, the Romans, are paying them to do it again. They studied us. They know what it takes, as Brother Zakwa Ahaya had him mentioned, how they, did this. they do the same thing by testing and studying us in the prison systems. They know what it takes. And they're doing it. And it's happening. Our people follow masses, and that's exactly what it did. That's why it said, um, it said, and who had made a public proclamation in the city that very day that Allah commanded them to get up to the temple 
and that there they should receive miraculous signs for deliverance. Now there was then a great number of false prophets right. born by the tyrants to impose upon the people who denounced this to them, that they should wait for deliverance from Elohim. Right. So the more of them just made it more substantial. They believe it if there's numbers there. Right. Not according to scripture, but if there's numbers, the same way the people believe the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Jews because they were numbers, but wouldn't believe Yache. We're in this, we're, it's all the stages being set again for the same stumbling stone, right? that precious cornerstone. Yache, we have to hearken to him. That's the choice. Continue there. And this was in order to keep them from deserting because they knew they were supposed to leave. Right. They knew the prophecy said go. Right. But they were paid to make sure the people stayed. They were literally paid for it. There's nothing new under the sun. The people are being paid to do it again, brothers and sisters. Make no marvel. And that they may be bowed up above fear and care for such hopes. See. Continue reading this. This is what, what, what they did here. Now, a man that is in adversity does easily comply with such promises. So you see how the adversity, seeing that there's tribulation, a trial of the faith, people are more given into their emotions and willing to believe a lie. That's why they were using it, using the heightened situation to get the people. Because they knew when you're scared, you want to hear something that's easy. Right. Hence, the people will go, they went up on top of the tower thinking there would be a miraculous deliverance because that's easy. Just go up there and wait to be helped instead of actually having to do and act and obey Ahaya's voice and do what he said to do and leave and go somewhere where you've never been trusting in Ahaya alone. Right. The same way the believers of Israel left out of Egypt not knowing what the land of Canaan was like, trust in Ahaya alone. They know what they're doing. Continue. For when such a seducer makes him believe that he shall be delivered from those miseries which oppress him, then it is that the patient is full of hopes of such deliverance. So you see, when one is in a bad situation and you hear something that's pleasing to the ears, that sounds accommodating to what you want to hear, then they're patient. Okay, we'll wait. We're sitting and wait. The deliverance is going to come. But that's not what the scripture said. Yet, through their fear, you see them giving over to it. Because the devil is subtle. He says what you want to hear. Yache says what you need to hear. Thus were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers, and such as belied Elohim himself. While they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident and did so plainly foretell their future desolation, but like men infatuated, without either eyes to see or minds to consider, did not regard the denunciation that Allah made to them. So the people belied Allah, that means they lied on him. They were bearing false witness on him by telling the people these things. And then the people couldn't even grasp the signs that Ahaya showed because they were already being lied to by false prophets, so they're already in the wrong direction. That lets you know how false doctrine also leads you in the wrong direction to set you up for the failure, the big kill when the devil comes out. And that's what they were doing in a similar to, that's what they were doing then, giving them false false doctrine, false prophecies, false interpretations. False hope. Right? So that when I showed his signs, the people couldn't understand it. Thus, there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion and before those commotions which preceded the war when the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day and at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone round the, the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which light lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but there was so interpreted by the sacred scribes 
as to pretend those events that followed immediately upon it. At the same festival also a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was a brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, and rested upon a basis armed with iron, and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watch in the temple came hereupon, running to the captain of the temple, and told him of it, who then came up to them, and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to be the valor to be a very happy prodigy. So they thought it was a happy sign. But continue. As if Elohim did thereby open them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of the holy house was dissolved so that of was its own sign. accord. That was what it was letting them know. The gates open. Your, your, your enemies coming in. Right. You don't have any hedge of protection. All right, continue. And that the gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that this signet foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. So people knew the desolation was coming, yet they stayed. Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the 21st day of the month, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunset, and chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds. So you're seeing troops, they saw visions and whatnot in the heavens, right? And surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast, which was called Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform the sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. Yeah, they tried to warn them. But what is still more terrible, there was one Joshua. Mm -hmm. The son of Ananias, a plebeian? Where is that? A plebeian? Man, sounds good enough to me, brother. A plebeian <laughs> and a husbandman, who four years before the war began, and at a time when the city was very great peace and prosperity, came to that feast whereon it was our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to Elohim in the temple began a sudden to cry aloud. Well, this dude, this is amazing what, what happened with him. A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Yorochalam and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, and a voice against this whole people. This was his cry as he went about by day and night. In all the lanes of the city, However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his, and took up the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did he not either say anything for himself, or anything peculiar to those that chastised him. But still he went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare. Yet did he not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, at very stroke of the whip, his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! And when Albinus, for he was then our procurator, asked him who he was, and whence he came, and why he uttered such words. He made no manner of reply to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty 
till Avenus took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was he seen by them while he said so. But he every day uttered these lamentable words, as if it were his remediated vow. Woe, woe to Jerusalem. So you see, he wasn't even worried about being around people or anything. He's just making every day, just saying the same thing. This is before the war even started. Continue. Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his reply to all men, and indeed no other than a melancholy passage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months without growing hoarse or being tired of it, until the very time that he saw his presage in earnest fulfilled in our siege when it ceased. So he did it all the way until the siege came. For as he was going round about the wall, he cried out with the utmost force, Woe, woe, to the city again, and to the people, and to this holy house. And just as he added at the last, Woe, woe, to myself also. So right when he said, Woe, woe, to himself also, what happened? There came a stone out of one of the engines and smote him and killed him immediately. And as he was utterly the very same prestigious, he gave up the spirit. So you see, the signs were there for people to leave then and they wouldn't believe it. Even so, the signs are only going to get more evident as the time progresses and draws near. So. So with that, we got an opportunity to look back to see what happened in the siege of Jerusalem, to get a, a glimpse of some of the things that are going to come in the siege of Babylon in America. And now we're going to go back to the scriptures. We're going to start at Isaiah chapter 13, verse 12. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wares of Ophir. Can you read uh, verse 15, please, of uh, Isaiah chapter 13. Every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Uh, second Ezra chapter 15, verse 15 to 19, please. Second Ezra chapter 15, verse 15. For the sword and the destruction draw nigh, and one people shall stand up and fight against another, and swords in their hands. This is race war. Everybody has their guns and their weapons. They're fighting against each other. Continue. For there shall be sedition among men, and invading one another. They shall not regard their kings nor princes, and the course of their actions shall stand in their power. So it will be anarchy. No laws to protect anyone, every man for themselves. Let's continue. A man shall desire to go into a city and shall not be able. So the cities are going to be locked down. Whether they got, they have their little militia groups there, guard in the city, you won't be able to just get in. You're not going to, there's not going to be free travel. You won't be able to just move around like you want to. All right, continue. For because of their pride, the city shall be troubled. The houses shall be destroyed and men shall be afraid. People, it's going to be war. Complete chaos. Continue. A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor, but shall destroy their houses with the sword and spoil their goods because of the lack of bread and for great tribulation. All right. This is when everyone is killing and pillaging with guns and weapons for food and whatever else they desire in the wickedness of their lust. This is why we are exhorted to pray to be out of North America. It's going to be some troublous times. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16 to 17. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. The children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. The houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. All that concept of doing this for your kids and what about your kids? To stay in Babylon? Kids are going to get killed right in front of your eyes. And then for those that that your wives, whether if your wives were hindering you and wouldn't believe and didn't want to leave and things of that nature, you know, making decisions to stay because your family didn't want to leave. Or then, holding your wife in a higher regard than Elohim. Right. Your wife is going to get ravished. Right. Can you read verse 17, please? Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver 
and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Then, after things have already gone so bad in Babylon, then comes a rain. Right. All right. I uh, hope you enjoy your Sabbath. I hope you enjoy the lesson. Praise the Hayat. All right. You all enjoy your Sabbath that day. Praise the Hayat. Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, church.